So I'm going to tell you a story today uh, because I'm a journalist. Uh, and it's a true story about a group of urban LARPers I encountered while reporting my book. Uh, their story didn't make it in, but I found them just fascinating. So it's not easy to organize a LARP in New York City, primarily because space, especially in Manhattan, is cramped and expensive. $200, about the max game budget for the LARP community I talked to, uh, that'll barely buy you a cheap hotel room in Manhattan, uh, let alone enough space for dozens of vampires and werewolves to politic the heck out of each other. In the mid-90s, LARPers used to gather at this goth club that ran Vampire Night, but that closed down and so they were out of luck. The local group was a racially, educationally, and economically diverse mix of college kids, professionals, and self-proclaimed street kids from the wrong side of town. The group pl primarily played White Wolf uh, games, which are games focused around factions of vampires or werewolves who were jockeying for power. And they handled the venue issue by finding free public space in Manhattan, which is the central borough of New York City. They LARPed in parks and public parking lots. But Hanging around parks late at night can be sketchy. Uh, Non-skanky public bathrooms are hard to come by. And in the winter, New York City gets cold. Not Finland cold, but still. <laughs> Finally, someone found the Winter Garden, which is a huge indoor public space. It's heated in the winters, air-conditioned in the summers, convenient to multiple subway lines, open until four in the morning. It had public bathrooms, indoor trees, restaurants, and a view of New Jersey right across the water. Uh, its location in the financial district, right next to the World Trade Center, became a convenient in-game hook. Vampires and werewolves gathered here because it was the seat of power. The Winter Garden quickly became the primo LARPing grounds in New York City, hosting a couple of different games each month. The LARPers made friends with the security guards. Different vampire and werewolf games ran on different nights, and frequently they'd play until the building closed, then head over to a local sandwich shop, city that never sleeps, right, uh, to run downtime scenes and gab about the evening session. Sometimes tourists snapped photos of them, but of course, if bystanders noticed players, then the players could be called out for breaking the masquerade. It felt deliciously transgressive to play in the Winter Garden. Of the place itself, a LARPer named Crystal told me, she said, there were so many places to interact, so many norms watching us. We're talking about bombs and people with assault rifles. People would pause and come over and ask about the group. Oh, we're an improvisational acting group. We're playing an improvisational game. And then, and then, 9-11 changed a lot of things that are bigger and more important than the local LARP scene, but it changed the local LARP scene. For starters, the LARPers temporarily lost their space since the Winter Garden was about 500 feet from the Twin Towers. Uh, as you can see, the explosion smashed the windows, it destroyed the pedestrian bridge that led from the towers to the Winter Garden, and it killed many of the palm trees. The city spent $50 million fixing the space up, and it was the first major structure to be rebuilt after the attacks. Uh, in September 2002, then-President Bush attended the reopening ceremony. But the LARP community didn't return for another year, and even then, the scene had changed into something more fragmented, uh, not merely because they'd lost their central LARP grounds, but because the attacks had changed the LARPers themselves. The attacks made some LARPers more resolute than ever to continue playing as if nothing had happened because terrorist attacks are only successful if they cause terror. Some players sank into the games as a way of escaping the bleakness of reality. Some players had lived near to the Twin Towers or had family members who lived or worked close by and didn't feel up to role play. One LARPer who lived 20 blocks from Ground Zero told me, he said, I got covered in dust. You weren't there. I was. I played at the Winter Garden. It was a place for me to go to do something that I really loved, where I could be happy. It was taken away from me. I was angry at the terrorists for blowing it up. I was angry at our government for letting it happen and not doing their job in maintaining defense. I was angry at all the people around the U.S. who bought the government's line and went to war. And I got angry at the whole debacle in the Middle East and all the kids who were being killed by being sent there. I didn't have much role play in me at that point. 
And his girlfriend actually ended up moving out of state uh, in part due to emotional repercussions from being covered in, in that dust, which was once people. When the vampire and werewolf games finally did return to the site, many players got their first glimpse of the area since the attacks. Of his first time back after the attacks, a longtime war LARPer named Warren told me, he said, we had to walk over the bridge from the subway. It was my first time looking at the flat earth, the construction machines sitting idle. It was almost a solemn feeling. It didn't have the same, I'm going to game excitement. Everyone did take just a little bit longer to get into the flow of things. Once they did, it felt like old times again, especially because I was seeing people I hadn't seen in a while. It felt like an old shoe you haven't put on in a while, and then you walk around again, and it feels like old times. Walking back across the bridge was uncomfortable. Later, he told me, when the games end, there's always a lot of joking around and socializing on the walk to the trains. I remember the walk to the train from the first game back. No one was laughing. Another gamer mentioned that a few people hung back to say a prayer over the excavation area. The man who lived 20 blocks from the Twin Towers was also more impressed with the location than with the game itself. He said, the first game back, it felt kind of weird. You could still see the towers from the Winter Garden, and I didn't look up at first until it was night. And when I finally looked up, you could see the stars. The towers were so big, and they were so well lit. They were a whole city block. The light dimmed out the stars. I went, wow, I'd never seen the stars before. I remember sitting by the marina and thinking, I never thought I could see the stars from down here. The comparison between the often violent nature of, LAR of the LARPs and the attacks was not lost on this LARPer. He reminisced the t uh, to me about the time that one faction of vampires, the Sabbat, attacked another, the Camarilla, by blowing up the towers a long time before they actually went down. He said, they flew something into the towers too. It was very uncanny. You don't want to think about that. You're playing make-believe, and when something out of your make-believe world happens, it makes you kind of sick to your stomach. The relationship between in and out of game terrorism would grow more problematic. Beginning around 2006, a number of different GMs made several attempts to incorporate 9-11 plots into vampire and werewolf games, but met with reluctance and resistance on the part of the players. Such plots are often viewed as being in poor taste and being a little too close to home. This tension, the tension between GMs who want to run plots with serious, solemn implications, seems at odds with the desires of players to take a weekend off from the daily grind. There's a sense, too, that some things are not meant to be played. Some events are too sacred to recreate, even if such recreation might be informative or therapeutic. And then, too, there's the sense that the script is already written, this act of terrorism has already happened, and it's not possible to prevent it in-game, only to prevent the next act. We can rewrite our own reaction, probably without prison torture or invading the wrong country, but we can't rewrite that in an indelible act itself. And to try to do so seems sacrilegious and seems to diminish the lives already lost and to make their terrible final moments into a farce. This dilemma, to bring the real into game or not, is an issue for many US LARPers. Uh, in my book, I profile a lifelong LARPer, World War II reenactor, and a former soldier named Jeffrey McLean. Uh, he's the guy on the cover. Uh, and he has four deployments under his belt, three of which were post 9-11 deployments to Afghanistan and Iraq. For years, he played a shining hero in his local game, which meets about two hours outside of New York City. Uh, he was a paladin of one of the gods of light in-game. But somewhere around his second or third deployment, his character became less fun, with the fantasy world echoing the reality he experienced on the ground. Certain aspects of the character, the way he stood in a doorway protecting a family, for example, roused unpleasant feelings and memories in him, memories that he didn't care to relive. His character tended towards zealotry, and Jeff had seen the effects of zealotry firsthand. At first, he didn't understand why the game roused such unpleasant feelings in him, but eventually he acknowledged that he had PTSD and sought help. And yet all of his hobbies, wargaming, World War II reenactment, and high fantasy LARP seem to have to do with war. Maybe these games offer him a safe space in which to relive and deal with what he saw on deployment, a way to revisit it in an, in an environment where he has some control over circumstances and outcome, 
which is an argument in favor of including realism in LARP. Maybe he LARPs because in a synthetic reality, everything has meaning and heroism is still possible. He may have started out as the hero paladin, but 12 years and four deployments later, he can't play that role anymore. Instead, he's created a new character and a new history for himself, a man named Radu Dragovic, a grave digger. His story echoes that of the Winter Garden LARPers. The intrusion of reality into a fantasy world can be disruptive and life-changing, both literally and metaphorically. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised that a major world event affected the subculture that I reported on, but I was surprised that it affected this community so directly by destroying the community's physical playground and altering the psychic landscape of the LARPers who gamed there. One woman couldn't bear to walk across the bridge where the towers once stood anymore. She always comes up with excuses, something she needs at the store, an errand she has to run to avoid seeing the space before and after game and others still haven't been back. Uh, and as another LARPer told me, she said, my ghosts of the past and the ghosts of those who died are there. It'd be like playing in a graveyard. Thank you. <laughs>